Mosasaurus hoffmanni was a giant marine lizard that went extinct living during the late Cretaceous period about 70 to 66 million years ago. As the most notable member of the Mosasaur group, it was considered one of the most fearsome predators of the ocean. With a powerful jaw and sharp teeth, Mosasaurus hoffmanni once dominated the seas, though its true size recently estimated to be around 11 to 13 meters remains a topic of debate. The discovery of its fossil in the Netherlands in 1764 forced scientists to confront the shocking idea that species could truly vanish from Earth. The path from curious riverbank discovery to recognition of a vanished ocean predator began in Maastricht during the 1760s. Quarry workers cutting chalk exposed part of an enormous skull, its curved teeth unlike anything familiar to local scholars. The fossil stirred debate with physicians, ministers and natural philosophers speculating whether it belonged to a whale, a giant crocodile or something yet unnamed. A second skull around 1780 drew even wider attention, especially when Johann Leonard Hoffmann argued for a crocodilian identity. This uncertainty reflected a bigger problem in the 18th century extinction was not widely accepted. Many still believed that all organisms were part of a permanent creation, perhaps living undiscovered in remote corners of the globe. The Maastricht skull pressed against that assumption. The jaws were too massive, the teeth too specialised for any known living species. Each description edged naturalists toward the possibility that entire categories of animals might vanish from history. The fossil story took an unexpected turn during the turmoil of the French Revolutionary Wars. In 1794, French forces seized it and carried it to Paris. Legends later claimed soldiers exchanged it for hundreds of bottles of wine, though historians see this as an exaggeration. What mattered more was that the skull reached the intellectual center of Europe, where it caught the interest of Georges Cuvier. In 1808, Cuvier closely studied its anatomy and concluded it represented a great marine reptile related to living monitor lizards, but unlike anything still alive. This conclusion was remarkable, not just because no dinosaurs were yet known, but because it made extinction tangible. If this predator no longer prowled the seas, then the natural world had changed in ways previously denied. Cuvier argued that the great animal of Maastricht offered proof that life's history was punctuated by loss. This fossil's role in establishing the reality of extinction became one of its greatest scientific legacies. The naming process followed soon after. In 1822, William Daniel Coney Bear created the genus Mosasaurus, meaning lizard of the Meuse River, grounding the animal in the landscape where it was first unearthed. In 1829, Gideon Mantell honored Hoffman by attaching the species name Hoffmanii. By then, what had begun as a local curiosity had become a reference point in discussions of zoology, geology, and natural history. The importance of these discoveries went beyond taxonomy. Before Mosasaurus, fossils often sat as curiosities in cabinets valued for rarity more than for what they revealed about past ecologies. The Maastricht specimen shifted attitudes. It was evidence of an entire lost marine ecosystem ruled by predators distinct from any alive today. Its size, teeth and jaw structure pointed to an apex hunter of ancient seas and the debates surrounding it helped define paleontology as a field of study. As more bones were recovered, the picture of Mosasaurus expanded and deepened. Vertebrae ribs and paddle-like limbs confirmed that this animal was no crocodile or whale, but a reptile uniquely adapted for open water. Its presence forced naturalists to imagine marine ecologies structured around reptile worlds in which lizards had conquered the sea. But the skull was only the start. The rest of the skeleton revealed how radically different this reptile had become for life at sea. Understanding Mosasaurus hoffmanii means looking beyond its skull to the rest of its anatomy because the true sea monster was shaped by the body that carried it. Unlike reptiles that still needed land to rest, bask or lay eggs, Mosasaurus had abandoned the shoreline completely. Every limb joint and bone became tuned toward a life spent entirely at sea, setting it apart from crocodiles or iguanas that straddle two worlds. The skeleton makes this commitment clear. Both front and rear limbs were reformed into rigid flippers. No longer useful for walking, they became stabilizers and steering planes adjusting pitch and roll while the animal swam. 
Beneath the skin, deep ribs curved outward into a broad semicircle, making the chest barrel shaped. This gave room for large lungs and likely cartilage connections that allowed flexibility under pressure, while also helping maintain neutral buoyancy, an adaptation shared today by whales. Most of the real thrust came from the tail. The vertebrae shortened near the middle and lengthened again toward the end, creating a stiff base followed by a flexible section capable of powering a two-lobed fluke. This design drove a swimming style known as subcarangiform, a method where the rear half of the body and tail supplied bursts of acceleration. The tail did the work of propulsion, while the paddle-like limbs acted more like fins on a submarine fine-tuning direction and stability. Together, these features turned Mosasaurus into a predator able to strike quickly in open water rather than rely on ambush. The build was as functional as it was imposing. The massive ribcage anchored sheets of muscle used to drive every downward thrust of the fluke, and the deep trunk supported stamina for longer dives. Unlike squat lizards on land, the outline of Mosasaurus resembled a streamlined torpedo. It was not the awkward sideways paddler that crocodiles still are. It was efficient in three dimensions engineered for power in motion. When visualizing this reptile, it helps to picture contrasts. Imagine a creature that still bore the scales and ancestry of a lizard, but moved with the efficiency of a shark, pumping its tail to close distances with terrifying speed. From the surface, it might have appeared as a vast shadow gliding beneath waves, but underwater, its swimming rhythm was rapid and decisive. Few ancient reptiles show such a complete remodeling of their skeleton to conquer one environment so thoroughly. Size adds another layer of complexity. For years, reports of Mosasaurus hoffmani reaching 17 meters, around 55.7 feet, circulated based mostly on jaw fragments and early scaling guesses. But the relationship between skull length and total body length is still debated, and applying simple multipliers may exaggerate the total. More recent and conservative approaches, which scale the skeleton relative to related species, suggest the largest individuals were more likely in the range of 11 to 13 meters, even at that size with body masses near 10 tons around 22,055 pounds, Mosasaurus still rivaled modern whales and far outclassed any shark in bulk. The variability in estimates reflects the gaps in the fossil record, but the message is consistent. This animal was among the largest reptiles ever to master the ocean. Taken together, these body traits, flippers, ribs, trunk and tail show a reptile that had been completely redesigned as an open ocean hunter. Form and function combined to create an animal built for speed and stamina perfectly balanced between buoyancy and force. That tail and body set the stage. Up front, the head finished the job. Some predators crush others pierce, Mosasaurus cut. Its teeth were not an afterthought, but the core of its arsenal backed by jaws built to deliver and absorb enormous impact. The skull itself was reinforced with tightly interlocking sutures, making it shock resistant while its thick jaw bones provided secure anchors for massive adductor muscles. The result was a bite that relied less on delicate mechanics and more on sheer force, allowing Mosasaurus hoffmanii to slice into prey and then use its inertia and grip to subdue it. This design made it versatile in ways many of its more specialized cousins were not. Looking at the wider Mosasaur family highlights this difference. Some lineages invested in crushing strategies. Prognathodon, for instance, carried deep jaws and tooth crowns that resembled blunt molars engineered to crack turtle shells or ammonites. Globidans pushed that even further with domed rounded teeth designed almost like hammers. These animals thrived by narrowing their diets to heavily armored prey. Mosasaurus hoffmanii followed a different path. Its recurved blade-edged teeth positioned it as a generalist one that could dispatch a variety of prey rather than lock into one strategy. This flexibility was a key factor in its dominance during the late Cretaceous. The specificity of tooth design reveals even more. M. Hoffmanii and its close relative, M. Missouriensis, developed finely serrated cutting edges along their teeth, ideal for slicing flesh and holding on to slippery prey. By contrast, species such as M. Conodon and M. Lemonieri evolved more slender, smoother edged teeth that were better suited for catching smaller fish or softer bodied prey. Another species, M. Bojai, splits the difference with slight crenulations. These differences are more than details together. They illustrate niche partitioning with species dividing available prey in the same waters rather than competing head to head. To Mosasaurus Hoffmanni's particular adaptations mark it as the broad spectrum hunter among them. Each tooth carried its own set of refinements. 
The enamel was prismatic with flat facets that strengthened the crown against stress, and the two sharp carini acted as cutting blades from front to back. A dozen or more maxillary teeth on each side paired with a corresponding row below could shear into flesh while replacement teeth constantly formed beneath, ready to push older teeth out. Far from blunt or fragile, each was a precision cutting weapon engineered for a lifetime of feeding in violent seas. The fossil record does not leave us guessing about how those teeth were used. Shark vertebrae scarred by crescent-shaped bites match mosasaur dentition. Sea turtle fossils preserve gouges where jaws clamp down across their shells. And in one dramatic instance, a small Mosasaurus missouriensis was found with the preserved gut contents of a one meter around 3.3 feet fish torn into pieces, crucially the only direct stomach content known for the genus. This shows mosasaurs could dismember prey larger than their skulls and then swallow chunks instead of relying solely on engulfing prey whole. It's a behavioral snapshot frozen for 75 million years. Violence extended beyond prey. Several mosasaur fossils bear the marks of intraspecific combat. A mosasaurus conodon skull was discovered with a tooth from another individual lodged through its quadrate bone, a wound it did not survive. Another specimen of M. missouriensis preserved a tooth embedded in its jaw that had partially healed proof of a fight it lived through. Whether these were territorial disputes, rivalries over mates or opportunistic cannibalism cannot be known, but the injuries confirm that these predators directed their formidable dentition against each other as well as against prey. Details like these show that their teeth were not just feeding tools, but instruments that shaped every part of their existence, how they hunted what they ate, and even how they battled among themselves. Teeth define diet, but they also hint at the intensity of an animal's lifestyle. To grasp what that lifestyle demanded, you have to ask not only what Mosasaurus Hoffmani could eat, but how much energy it had to burn to keep itself fed. The physiology of Mosasaurus hoffmanii points to an organism running hotter than most reptiles we know today. Multiple lines of evidence, especially the microscopic fabric of its bones and stable isotope studies, indicate these animals had higher resting metabolic rates than living lizards. Rather than being slow, heat-dependent reptiles, mosasaurs, including Mosasaurus, likely maintained at least regionally elevated body temperatures. In fact, their resting metabolic rate appears to sit between that of leatherback turtles, which generate some internal warmth, and fully pelagic reptiles such as ichthyosaurs and plesiosaurs, which show strong evidence of endothermy. This puts Mosasaurus in a middle but significant category, not as sluggish as a crocodile and not quite on par with whales, but certainly far more active than ordinary squamates. The actual markers of such physiology can be seen in bone-thin sections. When paleontologists slice through a fossil limb bone, they often find dense matrices filled with branching channels for blood vessels. Mosasaurus shows exactly this highly vascularized pattern a strong sign of rapid growth, sustained oxygen delivery, and high energy demands. Where a turtle or monitor lizard might add bone slowly and sparsely, Mosasaurus laid down bone more quickly, woven with circulatory passages that could keep muscles fed during long chases. Combined with isotope ratios that suggest relatively warm, stable body temperatures, the picture emerges of a reptile far better equipped for constant motion than its modern relatives. Such a physiology would have major consequences for where these animals could live. Colder waters, normally a barrier for reptiles that depend on external heat, would not impose the same restrictions. Fossil remains of related mosasaurs from Antarctica reinforce this conclusion these predators could thrive in environments well outside the tropical and subtropical zones. For Mosasaurus, Hoffmanni elevated metabolism likely meant access to offshore hunting grounds, cooler upwelling seas, and deeper layers of the water column where ambient temperatures dropped sharply. This flexibility enlarges its potential hunting territory and helps explain how it maintained its role as an apex predator on a global scale. The eyes provide an added clue to this active, wide-ranging lifestyle. Fossil skulls preserve large sclerotic rings and bony supports that anchor the eyeball. In Mosasaurus, the rings suggest relatively large eyes compared to skull size. This is consistent with a hunter that depended strongly on vision and coupled with a metabolism that could push it into darker waters, suggests versatility across light and depth gradients. Where a cold-blooded reptile would be confined to sun-warmed shallows, a heat-generating Mosasaurus could cruise between cloudy surface waters and dimmer mid-depths, driven by sight even as temperatures dropped. Reproduction also ties into this picture of a fully marine existence. 
Evidence from several Mosasaur genera, including neonatal remains and gravid individuals, indicates that these reptiles gave live birth rather than laying eggs. The young appear to have been precocial capable swimmers soon after birth. While direct fossils of Mosasaurus hoffmanni juveniles are sparse, the consistent pattern across the wider group makes it likely that this species shared the same reproductive strategy. This adaptation removed the need to return to land, further cementing its role as an ocean-bound hunter with a life cycle independent of shorelines. Ecologically, the implications are clear. A predator with elevated metabolism has to feed often and it can exert pressure across larger ranges than a slower ambush-based reptile. Studies of isotopes not only confirm metabolic intensity, but also suggest consistency across individuals, meaning this was not an occasional adaptation, but a shared group-wide strategy. In effect, Mosasaurus hoffmanii and its kin functioned in ways convergent with tuna sharks and even some marine mammals patrolling expanses of ocean, maintaining steady cruising speeds and unleashing bursts of speed when prey presented itself. The parallels are functional, not one-to-one, -one, but they show that energy expenditure shaped how this reptile dominated late Cretaceous seas. Mosasaurus hoffmanni combined a reinforced skull with slicing dentition, a tail built for subcarangiform propulsion, and evidence of elevated metabolism that kept it active in open water. These traits made it the dominant offshore reptile of the late Cretaceous, a hunter capable of tackling diverse prey and patrolling vast ranges with efficiency, but that dominance ended suddenly. The asteroid impact at the close of the Cretaceous erased this lineage along with most of its world. Which adaptation strikes you as the most impressive, its teeth, its tail, or its high metabolism?